Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Crillo. Today we have Chris Roberts. Chris holds investments in over 2,100 units across the country. His team also runs a property management business that manages his rentals, and they've recently closed on a 112-unit property in Georgia and a 104 property in Virginia. So thank you so much for being on the show, Chris. Thanks, Charles. I appreciate the opportunity to share, and hopefully your audience will get a ton of value out of this. I'm sure they will. Please tell us a little bit about your background, both personally and professionally, prior to being involved in real estate investing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, I had the entrepreneurial uh, itch at a very early age, whether it was uh, car washes or selling candy at school or sodas in high school in the lockers or uh, paper routes or you name it. I, I just always uh, was sort of, I guess, taught at a very early age that you know, if you want something, you got to go out and you got to hustle to get it. Mm. And I uh, was, was born humble beginnings, single parents, uh, 15 years old, and, and just really uh, didn't have a lot, you know, for us. So I had to go out and figure it out. And then I was on my own at a very young age myself, uh, came across a mentor at one point in my life that put me on the right path and, and sent me down a sales career, which uh, I developed up into a, a $25 million volume at one point mm. and um, became very successful at it. And then took those funds that I was making out of that career and, and started to reinvest them. And that's what sent me down the path of, of investing in real estate. And then today we own uh, every, we've, we've had land, construction, single mm -hmm. families, duplexes, larger multifamilies. And, and I also am partners in several other businesses as well. So nice. Okay, great. Yeah. So why was the main reason that you chose real estate as your investment vehicle? That's a very good question because there's lots of options. And I think most of mm -hmm. us are taught by default or, or taught or by default learn that you know you put your money in the stock market and you get this little tax benefit and it grows for you and maybe your employer if you're fortunate contributes to it and by the time you're 65 you can retire and you're going to be just fine and everything's great but nobody really gets into the weeds and starts talking about you know cost segregation studies depreciation um, advantages to actual tangible assets and and things of that sort and it's funny because uh, <laughs> let me digress for a second I had a conversation with the CPA and uh, a financial advisor at one point, and neither one of them ever talked to me about real estate. All they mm -hmm. wanted to do was look at my plans for, let's say, 65, 70 years old of retirement, and then tell me how much I need to invest in the stock market in order to mm -hmm. have, let's just say, two, three, five thousand dollars a month in income. And I thought it was odd that no one ever brought up real estate because other people in my circle of influence were talking about it. But I thought, well, maybe they just don't get it, right? So what's funny is it actually took an individual that I had dinner with to pound it into my brain. You need to open your mind up to this real estate thing and particularly rentals that cash flow. And so that's, that's really when I had that paradigm shift or that tipping point was that conversation. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. So let's talk about your first real estate investment. Uh, you uh, tell us a little bit about what it was. How'd you guys find it? What happened? Yeah. So to feed off of that conversation that we had, he says, one single family can get you this type of return and you can cash flow and then take advantage of the of the depreciation or write-offs or or whatever expenses. So I thought, okay, well, if I buy one single family property, um, now at this time I had a single family home that I lived in and I had bought a piece of land, but that wasn't really real estate. I just, oh, I can buy this land for, let's just say $20,000 over at the coast. I sat on it for like a year and I sold it for like 26,000 or something. I thought, wow, this is amazing. I made $6,000 on this piece of land. I just got lucky, right? But I did I did realize that you know, even though that was a modest return, it was a return mm -hmm. and I didn't know enough about it to keep diving in. So I had that in the back of my mind once we had this dinner, I realized, okay, I need to get into the rental space, you know, own this property that gets paid down by someone else that can then cash flow. And then eventually you can build equity as well, right? So I bought a couple foreclosures. Um, those were my first real properties. I don't consider the land real property. Uh, the, the single families were my first properties and they were foreclosures. And I started doing that about every six months and then came across some really good opportunities. Eventually, actually, I'll tell you this little side note. I bought a property from somebody who lived in Japan and they all they wanted was their taxes out of this property because their mm. sister-in-law lived there for 18 years, never paid anything. And she had like, I don't know, $45,000 in taxes over 17 years or something to that effect that she wanted out of the property. 
So I bought this property that literally day one appraised at around 120,000. I bought it for 50. I dropped maybe 10, $12,000 into a new roof and a few things. And that was, I don't know, four or five years ago. That property today, I paid 50 for it, is worth 329. Um, and that was one little nugget example of how someone knew I was in the space and tossed that lead my way. And then because I had the cash, I was able to make that thing happen. It was just a totally unique deal that we had to go through the Japanese consulate to make happen. It was interesting. But uh, anyways, go, going back to your question about getting into real estate, uh, I, single families was the way to go. And then I realized in order to, to really grow this thing, I need to exponentially uh, scale. And that's where we got into multifamily. Interesting. Was that a building that was owned by the Japanese person? Was that a frame built building or was that concrete block? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, my, my grandmother on my wife's side is Japanese. And her and all her friends around the World War II timeframe, a lot of them came over to this country from from Japan and overseas uh, during that time of, of war and after everything settled. And a lot of them bought in this area. There was probably 10 of them that bought houses 1969, 1973-ish is when they eventually bought. They got a little bit older and they bought. And this happened to be one of those houses. I think it was in the 68, I think was the year. And, uh, and it was the sister and she moved back and it just, it just, again, one of those unique situations that just came my way as, as luck as pure luck. Yeah. So. Why well, I ask is because I had a, someone on our show about a year ago and he works, uh, predominantly with Japanese investors. And if it's a stick frame building, uh, anywhere in the world, Japanese investors, I apparently can write it off the whole wow. thing in like four years. That's why I was asking because they yeah. use it as a lot of a tax shelter and uh, when they're doing it. Now that can be yeah. changed if, if that's different, someone send me a message. But as I understood it from a year and a half ago on my podcast, that's what it was. That's why I was asking. But very gotcha. interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. It, that's a definitely a unique experience you had there going to the consulate and uh, getting stuff notarized and doing it that way. Yeah, no, that, that's actually a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because I was not aware of that. And in her case, she moved back to Japan mm -hmm. after her husband passed away and then just needed to to off offload the assets. So that was how we interesting, got it. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. So... How are, uh, like, what are you guys doing now? Like, what is your criteria? What is your strategy for finding properties? Yeah, that's a great question. And and it's funny because I think you, you get into the space thinking, okay, I'm going to do everything. And then you realize, no, I can't do everything because there's a lot that goes on. There's mobile home parks. There's, you know, storage unit facilities. There's, a you know, apartments, multifamily, you name it. And there's also all of these different classes, right? A, B, C, yeah. and D. And so we we uh, we focus on the C in the value add space, and we've really honed in on a couple of markets. At first, we were talking to a lot of people all over the place a couple of years ago when we started, and then we honed it in. But now we entertain opportunities with other people as well. So sometimes people will bring us an opportunity and say, "Hey, I'm over. Let's just use an example. I'm in St. Louis, and I have this great deal. I don't have the experience, but." I've got the deal and I've got a little capital or something I'd really like to get in and learn. And we look at those. And if not, we mentor and help people along. We don't charge for it. We just assist and try to mm -hmm. put good value out there. But we do we do pop into markets here and there. But primarily, we're Southeast. That's where we like to focus. Nice. Yeah, it's it's great. Landlord friendly. Couldn't be any better, especially coming from Washington State where they are <laughs> not as landlord friendly, let's just say. Yes. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about your management. It's always interesting talking to operators that handle uh, a portion of their portfolio. Uh, they manage it themselves. So is that how you guys are doing it? You guys are managing everything in-house uh, of your portfolio or just ports of it in different markets? All the smaller assets. And the, mm -hmm. the main reason for that is, and I'm sure anyone that's had a rental can attest to this, First of all, it's a, it's a massive cost, especially when you're not scaled. You know, when your single family duplex is even under like I say a 20, 30 unit or even under a 50 unit, the cost just is just too high really. Um, now, if you bought a property really well, like we happened to buy a property not too long ago at 34,000 a door. I mean, it's incredible, right? You, you can do a lot with those price points, but if you're buying something at 60, 70, $80 a door and market is, you know, 60, 70, 80, there's just not a lot of room, right? You've got to be efficient. So the reason we went in house is on my single families and duplexes, I found that the property management companies I hired, one, were charging anywhere from eight to 10% a month, right? Two, they were charging a minimum of a half a month rent or a full month rent for flipping or turning a unit, which was outrageous. Because when you total it all up, it's like 13% cost to, to have these folks manage my property. 
And then I also realized that they were not treating the tenants. We're, we're big on changing the communities and helping people and being real people. I mean, we're, yes, we have to make a profit and all that, but I grew up with a lot of struggles and it's important to me to make sure that there's a human side of this thing. And it's not just all about profits. Right. And I found that there was constantly inspections. People were being browbeat. You know, someone has a hardship. It's like, you can work with them and they'll usually come around. Some people over and over again will not, but most people want to stay. And if you just work with them, it'll work out. Right. But you have to have a human side of things. So I found that they just weren't, the values weren't aligned. And so I, I got rid of all of them. I, I tried three different companies throughout several years and realized it was just easier to bring in house. So we brought on Buildium software. There's many, but we use Buildium and uh, hired a part-time admin to run things. And then we have great maintenance people and it, it works out and we, we, we make a better profit as well. And our customers, our clients are happy. So. Yeah. That's the big downfall with single family from the beginning. Now, if your like goal is, Hey, I'm going to buy 10 houses within this year or two years, and we're going to get that cost down to 6% or whatever it is. But most people that are buying one, waiting two or three years, buying another, if they're not self-managing it, the management company is the one making all the money because they're charging that 10% is not a joke. That's uh, that's like a nationwide single family house rental fee for doing it. And getting scale is if you can get a little scale in one area and you can use utilize that same management company or even better bring in your own. Because the thing is, like you said, with C-class properties, it's, um, it's a different client tenant base, right? Compared to B-class. And you can't be, okay, buy the book. It said the first, has to be the first that you have. You can do that, but you're just all day long. You're just going to be evicting people. You know what I mean? Right. You have to work with people. And I mean, obviously there's a line, you know, you know, everybody has to pay bills and needs a return on their capital, all your investors. But there, you know, you, it's, that's where good management comes in, where they can, take, you know, they can take uh, their experiences in that space if they're well seasoned there. And they can say, you know what, I will give you an extra week if you give me like a good amount of money today or something, some show of faith that you're not just going to leave next week and I have to go through this whole process again with you. So it definitely takes the right manager when you're in that C-class asset space. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if I may tell you a little side story as it relates to just that, we we took over a larger asset, 100 plus doors, and there was there was a lot of crime in the market. And I actually mm -hmm. met with the city council and I met with um, the chief of police and had a lot of conversations with them as we were acquiring this asset saying, how can we help? You know, how can we turn this thing around? They said, oh, man, all the calls there and blah, blah, blah. So we went in and within four and a half, five months, I think we're yeah, four and a half, five months. They, they I actually got a call from the chief of police. He said, I want to thank you because in three months, we have not had a single call in your building, not a single call. And we would get three or four a week in that building. Yeah. And that's astonishing. And I come, yeah. I was a reserve officer for five years, police officer uh, as a volunteer, but I was, I was full level. So I went out and traveled. I got into all the stuff and, and I, I learned a lot and I learned a lot about people as well. And also being a sales and marketing guy. So bottom line is we went in, we got rid of the trouble tenants because it was maybe eight of them or so. Right. And we went in with rules and guidelines and accountability and had conversations with tenants and invited them in. We brought the police in and let them meet with kids and hand hand out cookies and things. And we we showed them we are here to make positive change. And as a result of that, we won over the tenant base. And when you went over the tenant base, they want the trouble out as well, right? Because most yeah. of them are good people. And so as a result of that, we took the bad debt down by about 80% within I think four and a half months, even through COVID, hmm. right? Several people left. We didn't even have to evict them. They left because they didn't want the change, right? And then we also were able to raise rent substantially because people saw these folks care and they're fixing things up and they're getting rid of the trouble. And everybody has pride and ownership, if you will. And it's worked out fabulously. And then we couldn't get that with our single families. So we brought it in-house. Yeah. The worst thing ever is losing good tenants in the property because of other tenants in the property. And the more units you have, and it, it just can be like, it, you know, some, some tenants just don't mesh, especially when you're in smaller properties. And uh, I understand totally. It's it's definitely having that being a part of that community. And I remember when I was self-managing properties, you know, pr the police would drive down the street and you'd wave to them, you know, they'd wave back to you because you'd, you'd be at community meetings with them and you would know. And that's kind of the relationship you need to have with them when you're when you're running your properties, right? You're running businesses in their area and they're driving down your street, you know, 30 times a day, right? You know, running their rounds around and they have substations probably in tougher areas if you have property there. So it's just, you know, meeting with people in the community and uh, seeing how you can improve your properties. And when you're improving the properties, you improve the neighborhood, which improves everything. Everybody, it's a win-win-win for everybody, tenants, investors, everybody. Absolutely. No, and it's yeah. it's interesting. I so 
there's a there's a moral and ethical side to this thing, regardless of your circumstance or how you grew up or the experience you have in life. And for me, it's it's interesting. Deals have been thrown my way where they've said, "Oh, this is a senior center, and within a few years we can convert it over to you know regular you know multifamily, and we can bring the profits up. And we can do this." And I'm like, "But wait a minute, like convert it, shift it. That means there's a bunch of 55 and year old and older that are going to have to find a place to go, right? Yeah. Or even lower income. Like, so oh, we can do this. We get you start thinking. It's not always about profit. There might be a win win here, right? You have to get creative. But I think it's it really does start with caring about people. And then being sharp with your business, right? Like, mm. are you in it all the time? Are you analyzing data? Are you staying on top of things um, to find those opportunities that work within your circle of influence or within your frame of reference so that you can execute right and still be ethical and moral, right? I mean, yeah. hey, at the end of the, the day, you got to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and and smile and know that you're taking care of people and feel good about it. And then, of course, make a profit. That works out great. Yeah, yeah for sure. No, I totally agree. So- you're handling a lot of the uh, the money raising portion for your company. What what systems and teams? You talked about a little bit about your property management systems, but what systems and teams do you have in place to streamline your business? Uh, let's just say um, more on the uh, money raising portion of it. Well, I think the process has evolved for us. Um, mm -hmm. Again, you only know what you learn. You read. You you go to mentor programs or whatnot. I think it's really important that everyone on your first of all, you should you should build out a good solid team and make sure that everyone is a capital raiser, right? Everyone mm -hmm. is in charge of investor relations. Yeah. Everyone is selling your concept and your process and your plan. Everyone, right? Because we're all selling at the end of the day. It's just the best way to sell is not to sell, right? So what does that mean? <laughs> well. You go out there and you just have great conversations with everybody. Tell them what you're doing. It's amazing. I've had $100,000 investors that I did not know that I just happened to say, yeah, I'm in this real estate space and here's what we do and blah, blah, blah. And it's great. We have these, these kind of returns in this type of space. It's not an offering, but hey, blah, blah, blah. You're kidding. No. Oh, man. I've I, True story just happened to me like a week ago. Oh man, I've got I've got seven rentals and I hate those things. I make great money, but man, my wife's busy and we're doing this, we're doing and I go, man, I was in your shoes. I was absolutely in your shoes. This is what we do and why. And he's like, you gotta be kidding me. So we get on the call, he goes through the portal and boom, he's like, I'm in for a hundred thousand dollars. That was a passive conversation when I was talking to someone that was sitting next to him, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden he's in. So it is really important that everybody get involved. Now, yeah, I'm, I'm the primary investor relations guy. I'm the CEO and founder, and I just love dealing with investors and having these conversations. But my entire team is always talking about it because there's so much value in the concept. And they may resonate better with you know, Susie, who has the two children who's at the soccer game, when maybe I, I don't because I'm not at the soccer games with Susie, right? So that's really important to make sure everyone is involved. Yeah, it's important. It's it's kind of funny because if uh, you go to any kind of, any kind of party or whatever you want to call it, get together, and you mention you're a real estate investor, just like you can say in like seven words, your conversation will never end there. You know oh, yeah. what I mean? So everybody, because everybody knows someone that's made money in real estate, whether it's they sold their own house, uh, their parents sold their house for like three times what they paid for, or whatever it might be. Everybody knows someone that's made something in real estate. And uh, yeah. it's very, very interesting. But um, that's awesome. So how does your company, I'm always interested because, you know, with multifamily syndication, there's a lot of different players out there. So how does Sterling Rhino separate themselves from other multifamily syndicators? Well, Charles, the first thing we do is we focus on what we can be best at. In other words, yes, there's a uh, there's got to be a million syndicators. It feels like, and there's <laughs> there's only so many asset classes, and there's capital everywhere, and you got these equity firms coming in. I, I think I've heard in some of your past shows you talk about money coming down from the Northeast and wherever, right? My thing is, and I've always been this way. I I have always focused on trying to outwork everyone around me, and that's how I've been successful. And that seems simple, but it's actually not, right? Can you put in 18 hours a day, right? For seven days a week for, for five years. Most people go, oh, no way. They won't even try. Yeah. Well, I've done that. I've, I've put in maddening hours, which means I'm educating myself more. I'm learning more. I'm hustling more. I'm at more events, this, that, and the other, right? Yeah. So I think, I think it's really important for people to focus on those things to try to figure out, you know, what is it that I can do that's a little different? Well, maybe it's your messaging. Maybe it's your attitude. I mean, we really love this space and we help a lot of people and don't charge for mentor programs. So we get a lot of passive investors that will invest with us because there would be syndicators. They're like, look, if I invest with this guy, let's say, and I get in a deal, he's going to teach me everything for free. I didn't even have to pay for it. Not that mentor programs aren't great. They're awesome. 
but oftentimes there's not good fits with certain mentors and certain students. So you test the waters, you get in and, and all of a sudden you're learning how to go out and do your own 20 unit or whatever it may be. Mm. And we don't advertise that. I mean, I guess I'm kind of doing that here, but we, we just help people and it mm. tends to work out. We, people gravitate towards us because we're friendly, we're open and we enjoy this stuff so much. Um, and that's how we kind of differentiate ourselves. We have fun with it. When you get on an investor call with us, we're not your typical three piece suit, 10th floor building in the corner, staunchy, boring. Here's our returns. Here's what we do. Here's where we buy. Thanks. You're a great candidate or no, you didn't qualify. We like to have fun and get to know people. So. No, very interesting. So what do you see Chris for the next 12 to 24 months in real estate and, uh, in multifamily? Well, it's, it's, it's funny you say that because I've had so many conversations about this pre-COVID and then during COVID and then after COVID, right? And my team closed a total of four deals during COVID, okay? And if, if I was to say to someone when COVID started, we're going to close four deals, they would have probably hit me in the head with a piece of metal. Like, you're out of your mind. There's no way, right? So it's funny, I think, how we perceive things. Interest rates are going up. No, they're not going up. The stock market's crashing. No, it's not crashing. There's no assets. The market's overinflated. No, wait a minute. There's not enough inventory. So how can that possibly be? And on and on and on and on. So what we look at is, can we find opportunities that fit our criteria? Period. Right? Are there opportunities that fit our criteria? Do we have good broker relationships and deal flow coming in? Okay, if not, are we going to go after seller, you know, direct sellers? The last deal I got was straight from a seller. Brokers were involved at first, but then it was directly with the seller. Um, do we have to pivot a little bit? Maybe we do a little new construction project that works because one of our partners owns land or because someone brought it to us and they said, hey, I own a bunch of land, right? I've got the experience. I'm a construction guy. I'll bring my land to the table. Can you guys help me with the construction? So we get creative, but for the most part, as long as we stick to our criteria, COVID, no COVID, crash, no crash. What bottom line is there's more millionaires off real estate than any other medium out there in the world. And I can tell you that you can find opportunities as long as you stick to your plan. So what do we know it's coming in two years? We don't know. We have a feeling that interest rates are probably going to hold a little while. We have a feeling that inventory is going to continue to be fairly tight because it's mostly class A that's building and we don't buy class A, we buy class C. Um, but if you stick to your plan, you're going to find an opportunity. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. It's great. Uh, what common mistakes do you see uh, other real estate investors make? There, there are several, and there's top ones that I hear a lot, uh, whether it be, oh, they didn't raise capital, they didn't do this, they didn't do that. I would say, though, most important is identifying very early what your strengths and weaknesses are and not being afraid to network and bring people mm. together to execute the plan. Now, of course, you got to have capital, right? Of course, you got to be careful and isolate your market and do all these other things, which is important. But if you don't start by opening your mind and saying, I may not be able to do all of this on my own. And if I could, it might take me five years, right? You hear this great infomercial that says, oh, get rich, buy multifamily assets, do this two hour course. And you're like, <laughs> if, if you've ever done a multifamily asset, you, I mean, that's insane, right? Two hours. Yeah. I've got, I had 350 hours of my own time in my last deal, 350, right? Mm -hmm. So it's insane that somebody could think that. I think you need, you bottom line is you have to understand what your strengths and weaknesses are and put the right team together to help you execute because you can't do it all. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And it's, especially when you've, uh, you found an asset, it's under, it's under contract and you're putting together all the pieces to close on that property. It's literally weeks that you're just marking everything off your calendar and working on it. So, and you haven't even done anything yet. The property, you haven't done any work on the property. You haven't even purchased it. And then when you purchase it, you're like kind of relieved. And then you're like, well, now I've got like five years worth of this going on to uh, renovate this property and to get it up to the level that uh, our goal is for the neighborhood and for this property. Yeah. Yeah. And the stress. So um, what do you think are your main... Yeah, it, it's a lot for sure. Uh, what do you think are some of the main factors that have contributed to your success, Chris? Well, again, I touched on this earlier, but at a very young age, because I didn't have the the degrees and the pedigree and the you know the circle of influence that was real positive when I was growing up. The only thing I had was my attitude, my energy, and my work ethic. I mean, it was just be the best you can at whatever it is you're doing and literally just outwork everybody. Put in the extra hours, mm -hmm. show up early, stay late, smile, smile. And true story, from one of these jobs I had, uh, I was working at a hot dog cart. I met my mentor that, that literally changed my entire life. And he took me away from that place and gave me a job at a great business he was building. And it changed my life. We're in contact today, seriously. And it was because he said, 
Um, I can't teach what comes to you naturally, which is your ability to deal with stressful situations, your smile, your attitude. He's like, no matter how busy you are. And that resonated with me. And I thought, I didn't even know that at the time. It, it's all I had, which kind of came natural because it's all I had. But as I developed that skill throughout life, it also paid big dividends in the sales career and then obviously investor relations and such. So piece of advice, be genuine, but hustle. Put in the work and have a good attitude while you're doing it. Don't worry about what everybody else does. Awesome. Okay, that's great advice. So how can our listeners learn more about you and your business, Chris? Well, you can find me at uh, Chris at SterlingRhinoCapital.com. Um, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube. We got a lot of great, uh, a lot of great information for free there. Um, you can find us all over the internet and Facebook. And then I'm also starting a more of a business entrepreneur podcast called yeah. Charging Forward, and that'll be launching in a couple of months. So you can find us there. And uh, yeah, man, just reach out. We'd love to help you if there's any advice we can give you, um, point you in the right direction. And there's also a lot of really great mentor programs out there. So I'd encourage you, if you think you need that extra bump, go out there and, and seek out somebody that's a good fit for you. Awesome. Yeah, so I'll put those links into the show notes. And I want to thank you so much for coming on today, Chris. Awesome. Thanks, Charles. I appreciate it. It was a great time, man. And good luck to you. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Hi, guys. It's Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in getting involved with real estate, but you don't know where to begin, set up a free 30-minute strategy call with me at ScheduleCharles.com. That's ScheduleCharles.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars, LLC, exclusively.